Hello everyone, today we talk about the dissolution of the tetrarchic system that, as you know, is a crucial phase of Roman history that brings with itself a lot of uh, implications relatively to uh, historiographical interpretations as a whole of the period and also many problems of definition of perspective and more in general comprehension of this phase that, as you know, generally for the, the whole ancient world is it's not that we really know everything about it. Never think that you can't study the age of Diocletian or Constantine thinking that we actually know what it was like or that we can't even identify clearly what the various policies were. Sometimes they're mixed. Um, there are naturally certain historiographical uh, interpretations that tend to simplify the thing like you know that Diocletian was still the uh, guy of the old order and Constantine the one of the new one um, and and so on but um, it's really way more complicated than that and it's kind of ironic for a channel that now has made over 460 videos about uh, let's say ancient and especially medieval uh, history we've never dealt with um, the tetrarchy proper. We made a video on Diocletian, as far as I can remember. Um, uh, we made something much later from the from Theodosius and the, the choice of the East. We never dealt with the tetrarchy proper. And today we actually look at it from the end of its perspective. So I promise we will make uh, other videos that will provide a, a large introduction to the period to what happened before. Today we start really from the end in fact. So looking at the failure of a system that if you want um, was flawed since beginning which is something we're trying to describe uh, today. So I thought we can start from the ab abdication and the quies of Diocletian uh, and, and Maximian Herculius, right, that had been the previous Augusts in the Tetrarchic system that basically conceived the empire to be split administratively, therefore in terms of ma management, into in fact four parts, as the word um, means, um, and um, and it was based on this, um, you know, it kind of tried to answer a chronical problem of the uh, Principatus. Um, uh, I'm trying to use still the classical. Uh, pronunciational, but this is ironically the, the period in which we think that there was transition to what we call kind of medieval or ecclesiastical Latin, whatever. Um, one of the main f uh, flaws of, of the Principate, let's put it in this way, it was the problem of succession, right? The, the Principate had been based fundamentally on the concept that the princeps was just a first, in fact, among equals, right? Because it still stemmed from a republican principle. doesn't matter whether it became monarchy, uh, de facto, since the beginning, with some oligarchy that naturally shared power, etc. But it was still oriented under the, this point of view. And actually, the, the, the Roman Empire was, at this point, um, theoretically s still embracing the idea that, that power had to be um, somewhat shared, like that a sole ruler would have been something too radical, uh, or at least there had evidently been um, a shift towards the um, uh, restriction of, of power, the, the stratification of society, the vertization of uh, society, the strengthening of the elites. But this passage was uh, really um, coming in a moment where th things seemed, at least, not to be settled. At least this is an historiographical interpretation that was, you know, at least when I studied uh, Roman history, still do it, um, is... You know, it, it was being already challenged in some way because of, of what I was saying at the very beginning, that is essentially that we don't know uh, up to which point we can interpret this phase of passage in, in terms of um, actual uh, steps or or uh, that made the change. But it's obvious that the transition, especially from Diocletian to Constantine, that happens with the dissolution of the Tetrarchy does bring fundamentally uh, this uh, this great uh, acceleration at least towards the, um, the, the, the uh, let's say towards the, the autocratic character the monarchic character one point absolutistic character of the empire as we um, naturally 
Uh, no, and on, on this we could debate really a lot, because it's a very wide topic and we will have the chance to do it. For now, so um, the, the, the problem of succession was that exactly because the princeps could not um, be a dynast, right, it is something that the Romans absolutely rejected because they they were all about republican principles that is oligarchs that actually wanted to maintain this uh, equal status uh, and not to be uh, impose something from the above uh, was that he couldn't in fact appoint a um, successor at least to to have um, which happened by the way i mean it, it was normal in, in, in many occasions you realize that i don't know you, in every dynasty that was set on uh, the roman empire we talk in fact about dynasties so the appointment was kind of normal but it had theoretically always to be sanctioned by either the senate or the roman people which uh, broadly meant was uh, in a nutshell what the, the republic was meant uh, to be about um, always bearing in mind that also Rome was never quite a democracy, right? That there was not even a single moment in Roman history in which the people actually ruled. The people was kind of still always um, de facto, at least at the side of, of the situation. But still there was this participation, this shared power. That especially in the, in the West, uh, western half of the empire, had a kind of a, a deeper root um, because in the east where the Romans came to rule um, the the idea of for example uh, dynasties and 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 god uh, rulers like think about the pharaohs or the great uh, kings etc so it was kind of normal so it could be both um, the west always maintain a kind of a more you can't call democratic with all the, the limitations of the term character in this mindset. It's not a surprise in my opinion that uh, among other things telling the truth that Constantine understood the potential of the East especially given because of its wealth etc but also because those regions were fundamentally already uh, framed um, and this is debatable I realize it but they it is kind of true. Also, if you look at the social composition, etc., to the idea that there had to be a ruler, right? That there were civilizations that were or already set on on that uh, balance. Um, why am I saying this? Because the tetrarchy had tried to surpass this, um, um, let's say, th this problem of succession that had caused major wars into Roman history since actually the very beginning of the, the Principate um, with this kind of uh, collegial shared um, power um, kind of monarchic power definitely if you want um, that um, so in fact it is two Augusts and uh, two Caesars that basically ruled jointly in this uh, halves of the Empire the Augustus was more important the Caesar was less important the, uh, and the basically the the Caesar, however, represented the successor, that is, the, the future August, and who could in turn appoint another Caesar. So theoretically, this was the idea of Diocletian, that how he had said the thing. It's actually very machinous and very, uh, you know, uh, definitely it, it showed that it couldn't be sustained because the idea is uh, e even conceived from a broader institutional perspective. You know, what is that? At the end of the day, it is this this men were and that's why I, I'm kind of right with the perception that Diocletian really was part of the older um, of the old order because he didn't want quite want to um, to uh, surpass all what the the principate really had been he did really wanted a shared joint power that that could theoretically wo work in an harmonious way but definitely the crisis of the third century had deeply transformed Roman society towards a direction that had necessarily to surpass every ambiguity on this sense. It's either you want the old model that ac actually doesn't wor work anymore because the same social um, elements that made and political and social elements that, that, that made up that, that, that balance do not exist anymore or you have to, to accelerate towards something else which is the monarchical direction which Constantine understood very intelligently and uh, laid the basis fundamentally for an empire that would last for another millennium right so and this is quite important to me because at this point 
what you can you know if if you want to stress the difference between pre Constantine and post Constantine Roman Empire, you have at least to give that the uh the medieval Roman Empire lasted one thousand years, which uh which the uh the the ancient one basically didn't so whatever you want to frame uh, you know you know this is we we are i'm not particularly interested in the debate roman versus byzantine because in my opinion it doesn't mean much and secondly from a lexical point of view but it it's sec- secondly it's actually something very complex and complicated if you really want to approach it from a serious perspective and there is also in here no clear objective answer. I know a lot of people like to take sides, like either, no, the, the true Romans were one just of the beginning, yes, because you think that, I don't know, um, uh, Scipio believed, I don't know, that the, the Rome of the time of Caesar was the same Rome, like, kind of, that was a complete, you would have been shocked, literally. Or you think that even Caesar liked, I don't know, how the, the, the empire would have become at the time of, uh, of Hadrian, you know, it that's ridiculous, but um, at the same time, uh, as you know, and, and the other side you have just the kind of the Byzantine side of the story that says, no, we were kind of the best because uh, it, it's just an empire it was superior to the, eventually everything that, they hap- that existed in the West, and there is also a lot sometimes nationalism attached improperly to, to this stuff, and it's quite frankly quite ridiculous as well. And, and the problem is that, in fact, the, the story is way more complicated, and also in here, Never trust to whoever gives you simple explanations to this, because uh, it, these are topics that are, are universally known, uh, at least by competent people, as too too large, too extended to be covered. You know, and, and they they present a lot of deep, uh, let's say, semantic problems as well. Just for the terminology, for example, that. Is, is to take into consideration too much. That normally just even a single specialist cannot do. So um, uh, I, I understand that uh, fanboyism is everywhere, but hopefully we're gonna get rid of it. You know, it's, maybe it's just a P.O.'s illusion, but somehow we, we we could do it. So what? So Diocletian at one point. Now we don't have time. Basically, the, the first um, just to tell you wh- what we are coming from. Um, Diocletian and uh, M- M- Max- uh, uh, Maximian Herculius had been the um, the first uh, Augusts, mm-hmm. the first August, right? And at a certain point, Diocletian decided that it was better, basically, to get out of the scene, right, and to observe um, some, you know, from from the distance, from his uh, uh, palace in Split, incidentally. Um, how the system would have worked. Now, this is interesting because also back in the day, in the late Republic, in uh, naturally very different types, but in which you can find analogies with this one, Sulla had kind of done the same. You know, he basically reshaped a little bit the Roman institutions, not quite in a decisive way, nor like Diocletian uh, had done, and, and, and went living outside of Rome and seeing w- what was going on. Here, Diocletian Go, goes again, and he convinces actually Maximian to to do the same, and he wasn't very happy about that, telling the truth. And in fact, we will see that now he how he he reacted and complicated the story and, and became part of the uh, causes that the reasons that for which the tetrarchy failed, and um, and observing in fact from 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 the outside, leaving room from the previous Caesars. Um, theory, and now we see how it happened. So, um, is there a deeper meaning to this? Well, of course, from a philosophical point of view, even if you take the the concept of quies, you know, it's um, a a term that you can translate um, um, in, in in you know, it's dif- very difficult to actually translate. Uh, uh, Latin properly because there are certain uh, certain terms that can't be uh, properly translated. You know, in, in English, for example, uh, the yeah, you can't say the, the the calm, the quiet, properly from which quiet it comes, stillness. So, but it's it's deeper than that. In in Latin, it can be uh, also the rest, uh, the sleeping, the um, the ultimate sleep, even the death, if you want. Also, the uh, the night. So this moment in which 
things kind of stop, like, and, and you you can reflect. And this broad are also naturally positive. Um, you know, also a place where you can go resting. So a place where that has is tied also to the concept of otium, that is this sort of inaction, but it's actually a productive uh, inaction. Maybe not very fitting for quies, but uh, it can be definitely translated also as peace or tranquility, or serenity. Right? It, uh, quies was actually a goddess uh, in the Roman religion at this point. And um, and it was naturally an ideal of of uh, of equilibrium, right? You know the idea that on which the tetrarchy was based at the end of the day, so that this system had to theoretically evolve in a harmonious way and replicate itself again and again. That is also interesting because um, it uh, probably in Diocletian's mind, it 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 had some form of um, perpetual sanction, right? You know the same Diocletian was actually. Uh, uh, a monarch that accelerated the process of uh, verticization. Uh, it brought much of also of certain monarchic, um, um, let's say, approach to how the thing had to be dealt. And, and this already the fact of being able to decide individually to set this new um, this new system uh, working with the succession, etc., was you know. Ideally, somewhat a greater um, uh, per, uh, the the task, uh, let's say, of a greater uh, demiurge, right? You know that uh, was elevated at the point that could even decide how the, the fate of an empire had to 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 be like, you know, or how it had to fulfill it through this mechanism, right? Um, but paradoxically, it's the same abdication and quies of Diocletian. And Maxim, uh, Maximian Herculius that puts seriously uh, to the test the stability of the tetrarchic system, right? So, as it was foreseen, the uh, once the two uh, Augusts had uh, retired, the two Caesars um, became uh, Augusts, right? So. From one side, you have Maximinian Galerius for in the east, and Constantius Chlorus for the west, or Constantius, if you, if you prefer, still the, the ancient, the, the classical pronunciation. So also in here, by the way, mm, consider what uh, east and, w and west had become. You know, we made some videos about this. You can find both in the um, Roman or Byzantine history playlist, and only remember uh, the word many differences. Um, the, the empire had been evolving in um, in different directions. At this point probably uh, the Romans didn't quite perceive the um, the, the transfer the, the radical transformation from let's say the century before or, or to two centuries before. But um, the and in fact the, the empire and what we consider as really the, the deep crisis of the empire was far uh, or at least in part it had been left behind. Like at, at the end of the third century, you know that f since Aurelianus, so these are emperors, um, the so-called Illyrian emperors, um, the, the the great crisis had been surpassed. Objectively, the Roman Empire could have easily fallen into the third century. I mean, uh, it, it was perfectly plausible for it to happen. And actually, we, you have to look at what Augustus had been managed uh, had managed to to set. To understand, it was pretty much a good work. Like Augustus really set a system that worked um, effectively for 300 years, right? And that allowed these other um, rulers to to make it evolve on the same basis, to make it survive in the first place, and to make it evolve uh, on this new basis. Um, but we we can see already from here that um, not just Rome, <coughs> excuse me, and Italy had lost the original centrality of the empire, but also that the West broadly meant in, uh, I mean, the, the West actually, yeah, administratively meant, let's put it in this way, was somehow um, a uh, poorer system than the East, right? The East was where the majority of the wealth was, where the, the you can argue that part of this a political and social orientation favored a direct control, a more centralized control as well, right? The West was 
a bit different. And here we have the factor, the the real, not really the real first plate of the empire, but at least the, the first formal one, meaning that with the tetrarchy, you you have clear that uh, one Augustus and one Caesar were from the west, and and uh, the other two were for 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 the east, right? So this first idea that there has to be someone here, someone there was was set. I was pretty effective telling the truth. Uh, it's not a mistake. It's not a. Uh, it's kind of ridiculous when you say people. Oh, it was a mistake to split the empire. Well, it's not that they one. You know, one day someone woke up. Some Roman emperor woke up. The day said, "Oh, you know what? We have nothing to do. Let's split the empire." You know, this was actually a pretty effective thing they did to administer an empire that was meant to be unique. And it's also very interesting that in Roman history, in spite of the rivalries that would emerge. Um, naturally, between the West and, and the East, um, at some point, um, the really the, the the principle that these were just two administrative divisions that the empire was one thing, was factually respected. Like um, it, it was not a subversion of this principle for which there was the hypocrisy that this was like a single empire. Then nobody really cared. It was really so. I mean, even in terms of military support, um, etc., th there was a pretty good synergy between the two parts. And this administrative split was definitely aimed at maintaining uh, a more direct control um, from um, the, let's say, the, 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 the strategic centers of the empire on the surround, the outskirts, like on the borders, they naturally were afflicted by by uh, invasions and, and had to be controlled. Um, there's much of a properly strategic reason behind this and it was actually a very effective thing to do. You know that at this time there's also a, a process of centralization, much also of the uh, armory production and the same position of the military was brought once again towards the internal areas of the empire that is basically the Mediterranean regions so that uh, Usurpers and barbarians could not um, seize these assets and certain rebellions that were, however, really chronicle and endemic throughout all this period. Never think that the barbarians were the the problem here, the, the biggest problem. Uh, the the biggest problem was definitely the internal uh, Roman functionment, and you can't see this, uh, you know, quite clearly even after events like Adrianople 100 years later when, yeah, the Romans get defeated by the Visigoths, but, you know, after, uh, you know, like a decade, they, they could field much larger armies and, and, and fighting against each other as Romans. That is, is not really, uh, at that point, you you understand that you can't say it's it it, it was really Adrianople. That, that, that is something pretty pretty unknown among, among Romanists um, and uh, I don't have to explain it now also because we are in a bit of a previous phase but it's important to, to make understand uh, in my opinion the um, how for example the center could remain theoretically the center like Rome in spite of what is commonly believed always remained the capital there was never a moment in which Rome was not the capital of the empire there were ad new administrative capitals you can find in uh, Trier, uh, in Milan, uh, in Nice, uh, in uh, um, Nicomedia, uh, and um, eventually in Constantinople, as you know. But formally, you know, the, the ideals of the empire was were at the end of all the same, and these centers became important simply because they were they had massive strategical importance, chiefly for the army along the frontiers or close to the frontiers, and for much other, even for logistical reasons, etc. But we don't have to repeat it now. As long as you obviously understand that here the Roman Empire is not a monolith, that there was never a moment in which the Empire was what ideally we think of the Empire was, um, that it changed continuously. There was never a fixed point. It was always an evolution. I started recently this uh, new series of, of videos on Roman history because in order to, to explain this in, in some sort of detail and in, in progression, right? So, uh, looking at these figures, first of all, Galerius, that we... Uh, uh, Maximianus Gal uh, uh, Galerius. Um, what was he? Well, he was Emperor uh, August here from 305 to 311. 
And he, um, and this is a bit of a typical character of many rulers at this time, that he had actually some obscure origins in the Illyrian provinces. Um, this was typical because we have seen that during the 3rd century Illyria produced this um, solid bulk of, of manpower because one of, one of the uh, areas of the empire was least Romanized and it was still relatively primitive so that uh, its inhabitants would be more likely to join the army rather than other gentrified, pro in the, the inhabitants of other gentrified uh, regions of the empire and produced this pretty good, let's be very honest and serious about this, very good um, generals and emperors uh, uh, that were theoretically the same thing um, that had saved the empire partly and it was normal for from this man of power to emerge at this age, at this specific time in history from the Illyrian provinces and he, uh, Galerius was a veteran, he distinguished himself um, in the wars of the second half of the third century and, uh, and, and um, that's why he was appointed back in the day in 293 by Diocletian and Maximian uh, uh, the, uh, as Caesar, right, like to, to, together with Constantius Chlorus and uh, eventually Galerius also married um, uh, uh, Valeria, that was the um, daughter of Diocletian, and he was entrusted with the control of the Danubian provinces and the um, Balkanic Peninsula um, with his habitual residence in Sirmium, right? And, um, and in fact, in, in previous years, he actually uh, demonstrated his, his, his uh, prowess in 294. Um, and uh, in the following years he defeated the Sarmatians with a series of expeditions, eventually the, the Carpi, the, the Bassarnae, uh, the Goths and other barbaric populations along the, uh, the, 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 the Danube and that at the time were pressing or, or the Roman uh, territory. Eventually he was called by Diocletian to defend the eastern border. He crossed the Euphrates with uh, for forces that um, and um, that were probably not sufficient at that point and in fact in spite of great proofs of, of valor he was defeated by uh, the Sassanids uh, albeit the year after 297 he penetrated with a very uh, s uh, swift march into Armenia and uh, he um, basically assessed um, with uh, the, uh, bold exploration led in person of the uh, enemy positions and ass assaulted them uh, impetuously and, and, and annihilated them. So he led other operations in Corduan, in, in Media, in uh, Atropatan, and um, while Diocletian was moving um, from the Euphrates through uh, the Euphrates to uh, through the Mesopotamia, he stopped in Nisibis where uh, Galerius uh, rejoined him. Right, and in fact, Galerius would have liked to continue the war, but the old emperor preferred to um, collect the fruits of victory and imposing, at that point, imposing at the per, uh, to the Persians a um, you know a, a advantageous and honorable uh, peace for the empire. Right, and eventually Galerius started once again to control the Danubian frontier in 299. Uh, he fought against the Marcomanni and against uh, and and again towards uh, against the Sarmatians, and um, and that's on May the fir the the first two hundred and five that he was eventually uh, uh, with the abdication of Diocletian and Maximilian he was appointed um, Caesar. Then. Constantius Chlorus instead. He was Constantius uh, the, the first. Uh, he was uh, eventually called um, Chlorus from the, uh, the, the actually from the Byzantine times. His name was Flavius Constantius uh, in, in Latin, and uh, he was born in Illyria as well around the mid third century, and uh, he he would die in York actually in Ebracum in Britain. Uh, 306, uh, 306 and um, he was the founder of the so-called second Flavian dynasty that would rule um, in, the, in the Roman Empire in the first half of the 4th century 
and he came. He was apparently from a humble family as well, um, and uh, he um, in in two hundred eighty nine had um, become um, sort of president of of Dalmatia, and he perhaps was prefect of uh, the Praetorium in, um, under Ma uh, Maximian. Um, so he uh, was eventually adopted by Maximian as uh, and and appointed as Caesar together with Galerius in 293, as we have seen. And he was entrusted with Gaul and Britain, right? And uh, he he also distinguished himself. So there are kind of similar figures in here. He defeated the uh, usurper Electus, and he um, also um, defeated uh, multiple times. Uh, the Franks and the Alamanni, uh, and uh, he uh, also uh, applied the edict of persecution against the Christians that um, w had been emanated by Diocletian, although with a large moderation. This is also very important to understand in Roman history that you know when you look at the persecution of the Christians at the beginning, it was something really. Um, you know, some of them were pretty harsh. Naturally, people were killed, but um, in the the way these um, um, provisions were practically executed were were, were much a discretion, uh, uh, yeah, discretion of the local uh, pr provincial rulers, and this could really vary. And also, the the, the, the we we have now we can't go into detail, but also relative to these persecutions, we know that the outcome was relatively moderate. Um, so, in uh, uh, he became uh, Augustus um, as as well, right? So once these uh, Galerius and 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 Constantius Chlorus were uh, appointed uh, Augusts, and Diocletian and uh, Maximinus uh, uh, and Maximianus, excuse me. Uh, um, uh, Herculius had uh, gotten out of the way, um, at least uh, in theory. Uh, also, the, the two the two new Caesars had to be appointed, as the tetrarchic principle really uh, dictated. So, uh, th these were Maximinus Dia, mm -hmm. that um, uh, and uh, Severus, right? So, Maximinus Dia was the Caesar of uh, for for the east, so with uh, the August uh, Galerius and Severus, uh, the Caesar of of, of the west uh, of Constantius uh, Chlorus, right? So, looking at this uh, two uh, figures, um, the the first one, um, he uh, he also was born in Illyria. From a half sister of the Emperor Galerius that was adopted by him, uh, and, and that that excuse, excuse me, yeah, that, that that adopted him actually, and, uh, and that's the reason why he was adopted Caesar. Now he was entrusted, um, was elected as Caesar and entrusted with the government of the dioceses of the East and of Egypt, and um, eventually, as we will see, he will be. be Proclaiming himself Augustus, but his own soldier. That also was the 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 thing. How many of these commanders practically reached uh, the top? Uh, Severus Flavius Valerius Severus um, was also also an Illyrian. He was of pretty rough customs. Let's put it in this way. He at least apparently. And um, and also for the favor of Galerius was appointed as Caesar in 305, and he became actually pretty quickly um, uh, Augustus um, at that of Constantius uh, Chlorus, right? So, um, looking at these figures in perspective, um, practically the, the most authoritative of the um, this uh, the, the new. August was definitely Galerius, right? That uh, had, as we have just said, uh, also a great influence on the Caesar of Constantius Chlorus, Severus, right? Albeit, albeit, at a juridical level, uh, definitely Constantius Chlorus remained 
and, and was by right the senior Augustus right so he was technically the, uh, the by name who was the most important one now by Galerius was de facto the most powerful um, but also in here we can find a sort of um, sort of mistake of a contradiction of what the tetrarchy was supposed to be because the appointment of Severus mm, um, um, it, say um, is is, per is peculiar at least because um, Severus was a an actual faithful follower of the of Diocletian's policy, um, and um, in uh, in uh, of, of this backing of Galerius, however, however, he didn't have um, uh, he didn't got a great advantage in the West. He didn't definitely have a prestige such a prestige to counterbalance, for example, the one of Constantine, right? That was the illegitimate son of Constantius Chlorus, especially in the Gauls, um, and nor of Macentius, that was the son of uh, Maximilian Herculius, who instead had this great power in Rome, especially among the Praetorians in the urban cohorts, and in general in Italy. So there were already certain men of power that now we will observe because they will become especially for the west the protagonists as you know they were more powerful than what the new tetrarchs basically or at least their successors um, de facto uh, were right so talking about constantine i don't think we have to present him but you know flavius valerius constantinus um, he eventually known as constantine the first Emperor, called known as also the Great, uh, etc. Um, he was born um, probably at least in, in 280 from Constantius Chlorus and Helena, like in 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 niche in, in the in the province of Mesia. And he first uh, Constantine lived first at the court of Diocletian. Then he followed his his father in Britain, and. Uh, in, in here, basically, at the, in 306, at the death of his father, uh, he was acclaimed as emperor by the army, but not recognized by Galerius in that sense. Constantine, great commander, he defeated the Franks, the Alamanni, etc. And eventually, we'll see now what we'll do, but uh, we don't have to present him, really. Um, uh, Macentius also, Maxentius is also this uh, great... Uh, uh, figure that is uh, sometimes overlooked because he was eventually, as you know, defeated. He is seen as one of the great defeated of history, but it's also a very fascinating figure about whom we don't know really much. And probably he had some cards to play that he maybe played badly because at the end of the day, th this happens hist historically speaking. Like just because someone wins, it had, it had to win. No, no, really not. It, it's it's not that easy, you know. If History was that easy. We would stop studying it uh, very, very, very quickly. Um, he, um, Maxentius, was um, son of a Maximian, right? And after the abdication of his father in 305, as we have seen, um, he was excluded from the, the, the succession. But after the um, the acclamation of Constantine, uh, he was uh, he had himself proclaimed August Augustus by the Praetorians in Rome in 306, and he also appointed as Caesar his son Romulus. Eventually died um, young, and uh, he actually pushed for Maximian to to come take back the imperial authority, right? But also in the, in, in further reorganization as we will see he will be temporarily put put aside and eventually after four years uh, defeated um, and, and these two figures are, are very important because as you understand they have solid power in two very very important areas uh, in uh, uh, in the West right and this is why uh, especially at the death of Constantius Chlorus in 305, the system begins to to crumble, right? So 
on um, as, as we have seen, um, Constantine is acclaimed as Augustus by his own troops on July the twenty fifth, three hundred and six. From the other side, on September the twenty eighth, three hundred and six. So really, a few months uh, difference. The Praetorians acclaimed Maxentius. Right. It was also supported by the Roman plebs. This is not uh, a minor, um, you know, uh, element. He. It's very interesting to see that among his supporters, he also had uh, the the tribune that, that presided to the Forum uh, Suarium, that was the the pork market in Rome. That you would say, oh well, what the pork market? But Rome was not really a city like all others. This was a figure that um, was very close to the people. And uh, and feeding the plebs was dramatically important. Uh, Rome worked with corporations that also had the, 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 their own power on their own. So having the power from this strata of the population was very very meaningful. Um, the as we were saying before, he was supported by the Praetorians. So what, what had been traditionally the imperial guards and also the urban cohorts that were theoretically the guards of Rome, that had been uh, created institutionalized by by Augustus. Um, so the principle of hereditary succession at this point was proving itself to be stronger of to the let's say both aristocratic but at the same time rational or rationally uh, oriented principle of adoption. Right? So the tetrarchy as it had been projected let's say planned by by Diocletian starts immediately to to crumble uh, and and to to show it its internal contradictions right this was a clay the, the empire had become a, a great clientele right it had arguably all, all, always been but after the third century it was really a matter who had a lot of factual power that at this point was not really delegated by by a, a superior authority like the proof of Constantine and Maxentius is exactly this one, you know, that they had troops that were loyal to them, that could control core areas of the West. The West, by the way, had, uh, in, in many ways, still a pretty sound, pretty solid army at this point, pretty pretty strong resources in spite of all, especially from the military point of view, much from the economic, financial point of view, but it had always been like that. The East was slowly evolving towards something, and especially with Constantine, will will happen this. Um, uh, the Constantinian army was a masterpiece, but incidentally, Constantine comes from the the northwesternmost uh, corner of the empire, from Britain, from the Gauls, right? You know, so uh, also in their dimension that shouldn't be forgotten. Albeit, as we have seen, basically all the emperors were Illyrian, right? So, um, what what is interesting uh, of this is that uh, the, uh, the there couldn't be a balance at the end of the day, between the ideal system of succession and this crude, naked forces that were, were seizing power anyway, right? Um, and after all, um, Maximilian Herculius, in spite of uh, his position of, of ex-Tetrarch and um, main supporter, actually, of of the Diocletian building uh, was siding <laughs> together with in favor with the hereditary principle, right? So, in many ways, because you know Maximilian had never quite liked Diocletian's decision, right? They had been working together; they had kind of created this empire, supporting each other. They had fought together, etc. And it, you know, as long as you know you you come from a common uh, ideal, etc., everything is fine. But when you realize that this you know, new generations emerge, new uh, new forces are put in. The situation ca becomes kind of difficult. Maximilian had never been particularly satisfied of the Euclidean decision to say, okay, you know what, now as Augusts, we, we get out of the scene and we simply observe and we uh, render all our power to someone else. You know, he had never accepted it. He evidently wanted to participate to the power that at that point he had, you know, he presumably failed to have earned, right? And not just by right, but by God, you, you can say. Because at this point, you know, at this point it's become kind of mantra and underlying how at this point really 
um, uh, the uh, in, in the ancient world in general, really military power that was basically the one which institutionally the Rome was founded because the Imperium is exactly this, is the, the faculty of military power, is given by, by the divinity. Here it doesn't matter whether we're talking about the ancient deities, uh, even of the pre politist pattern of Rome or the, 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 the eventually the Hellenized view or the, the anatheistic cult or this solar deities or Christianity that is it, it it was from basically all over um it came from, from all this perspective, especially in the military, we know that um the the, the military deities were you know we were really at this point the military was becoming a sort of a caste right that they were not the citizen soldiers at one time they were the guys who de facto controlled the empire with iron fist they had to <coughs> excuse me to become this through the crisis of the 3rd century they was these were all men the, this older generation that had earned their power in blood literally and they had gone through some of the worst conflicts that the ancient world had ever seen and uh, and had emerged victorious so really they felt a lot the prestige and the pride and the 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 uh, of of having won this right by divine sanction what what Diocle what makes really Diocletian anachronistic at this point is exactly trying to revert to a sort of more ideal and balanced view of of, of this of 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 this power like of of, of, of power sharing etc it, it's basically impossible to uh, to understand what these individuals singularly really believed we we don't have probably we should ask them we should have asked them but and there are in this perspective kind of mm, let's say broader and and deeper conceptions that you can still find with other parallelisms before of of uh, um, men would, would, like Diocletian would probably legitimately had kind of more sophisticated if you want even more archaic and philosophizing idea of uh, of, of, of of the empire it's a bit difficult maybe to call Diocletian in this sense for you know kind of a philosopher but um, there was some echo of that um, bands of of the Roman ideals that the tetrarchy is ideally permeated by, in spite Diocletian pressed towards the the the, the, the monarchic um, accelerated towards the monarchic direction, even with the proscunuses and all this stuff. Um, that's why it's sometimes even difficult to understand who really created what between Diocletian and Constantine, right? Because Diocletian already contributed heavily to the monarchization let's say of 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 roman institutions so uh, it's complicated but um definitely this was refused by men who had had a much more strongly and, and kind of militarily and less and pragmatically let's say a less ide idealistic oriented uh view of what power should should be um so um at this point there is the marrying uh, between uh, Constantine and Fausta, Flavia Maxima Fausta, huh? that was in fact daughter of Maximilian and uh, and eventually, in fact, as we've seen, wife of Constantine the Great in 307. Uh, eventually, she would be killed by, by her own husband, but you know, that's a later story we will tell another time. Um, but this was a very important way of bonding relations. You, you understand this is already a, kind of a dynastic perspective. You know, these powers are held together even by family ties, which is normal, right? It's perfectly, um, and, and and from here you can really get the monarchization of power in 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 this period and how it was working, right? And by the way. Um, Fausa had already been promised to Constantine as a wife from before uh, the death of Constantius Chlorus. So, so it, it wasn't also in here a surprise or anything particularly exceptional, but it kind of strengthened a bond now that had much, um, you know, very deep um, political meaning. 
uh, for the balance in in especially in the West. So, in other words, it, it, it's as if the uh, the the old um, that Diocletian had tried to to bury was you know coming back prepotently on the scene, right? So um, the um, the this in this sense, uh, Maximian rejected very easily in some ways the promise made to Diocletian to November three hundred and three not to um, I mean to to get out of of the way in some sense. Severus that we mentioned before because of the, his lack of power was simply eliminated in three hundred and seven. So this is how also how problems you should, you get rid of problems simply he was killed. Now we don't exactly know in which. Um, context, but he was put out of the way, also because, um, as we've seen, he didn't quite have supporters in the West, as it had been um, wished by by the the early, uh, I mean, the, the tetr tetrarchic succession of 205. But um, at at this point, actually, Maxentius uh, didn't recognize the superiority. Um, of his father, right? This is particularly important because uh, he um, also in here you realize that there are um, substantial uh, uh, enmities, uh, substantial powers and interests, uh, even within the same family. Uh, family is and uh, their the balance of power was very personal. Right, you know, there was a lot. Even uh, how the the military hierarchies were built were really ad personam in, in many way. Um, so, uh, many ways. So, um, the um, Maxentius at this point had, uh, in fact, a great power on his own. He was he was ruler of Italy, uh, of Africa, where in three hundred and eight he uh, put down a repressed a, a revolt. Of the vicarius of the vicary, Demetrius Alexander, and also of part of Spain. And as we reminded before, in Rome and in Italy, he had always had this um, great amount of followers, because many Italians had seen him as um, a key figure in the reemergency of, of Italy, as the uh, let's say the center of the empire. This is. Um, a controversial um, idea, like to assess, because naturally, um, as we've said before, Italy had lost the, the centrality in, in the empire. It was obvious already at the time. This will be perfectly evident even with Constantine. And in this sense, Maxentius' defeat is not to be. Uh, it's not really uh, random that he, uh, Constantine, obviously cho chose the east, but let's say. From from uh, these previous times, other centers had emerged, uh, but Italy was still very important. Like it, it was a wealthy area; it, it controlled with very well placed the Mediterranean, uh, strong connections with Central Europe. Um, and this uh, Italy is very composite, so there were several uh, strategic advantages. It was a key uh, area to. To, to rule from in the West, and definitely it would remain till the very end. Um, so, the um, let's say in in Italy, many believed that um, there could be a sort of revival of Italian power in um, in the empire, in the direction of the empire. This was something that had been um, uh, celebrated since the age of the Gordians in the third century, and it was felt as a form of reaction to the changes that were occurring. Remember that Italy had the senator senatorial aristocracy that was still extremely powerful. Uh, it's still, many senators believed that Italy had to be at the center of the empire, um, as it was right to do. Italy was the, in many ways, the the hard stock were. The the, the 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 strongest uh, traditionalist perspectives were maintained, especially among the senatorial classes, um, that at this point were so powerful they encompassed naturally much of the peninsula in terms of economical direction, even of Africa and part of Spain. I mean, it was really um, more than just a um, 
passive uh, region like other provinces had been dealt with. But naturally, Italy had been depleted of a substantial por uh, for part of its power. Uh, Gaul had become more important because there were more resources there that could uh, be exploited. So it's it's very important now to understand the the various the, the crossroad that the situation represented. Maxentius, many people say, well, he was defeated, so he was the great defeated point, end of the story. Well, no, because first of all, we know a very few about him. Um, and we don't, and th there are many uh, aspects of the story today we can't get into details, into details of the, the Battle of the Milvian Bridge, of all the, the campaign of Constantine against Maxentius, etc. But in general, there is this perception that he had to lose, right? It, it, it's not truly really so. Maxentius. Uh, objectively could had some some sort of advantages that he probably didn't exploit or couldn't exploit or um, you know uh, it, it sometimes even from small decisions much can happen so uh, for example well whatever uh, the same idea of attacking uh, accepting battle outside of the gates of Rome probably was really a problem probably Constantine didn't have the forces to, to seize Rome with, with a siege um, but um the and and and, and the, he had much support as we have seen um not ju just by Rome and Italy in general but also because of his broader political and religious um, um ideas like um he for example uh, uh he was very equilibrated um under this point of view. He was very shrewd also in this sense, very astute, um, as he was tolerant, for example, towards the Christians. Um, that also brought to him many sympathies. Always remember, uh, since before we were mentioning about the plebs, that those um, support went to, to Maxentius as well. The Christians at this point were still uh, were, were persecuted, right? So they were the lower strata of the population represented this, also masses of dispossessed, etc. So um, and, and Maxentius was probably in this sense very clever to to back still the hopes of a Roman Senate that wanted to come back at the center of the empire with its strongly in elitistic, aristocratic policy, mindset, culture, etc. But at the same time, he was kind of winking also at the masses, um, at the universality of Rome in other ways. So he was actually a very good pretendant, and it would have been very seducing to see what his uh, policy would have been if he hadn't um, been killed and... Uh, so it was still an option for things to be not truly really reversed, but you know, I'd say it could have they, they could have gone into um, still a different way. Um, so um, when um, um, the uh, at this point, uh, family problems. Um, Maximian Arculius was extremely angry, <laughs> dead, uh, deadly angry with his own son, Maxentius, and uh, he uh, uh, somewhat uh, came back as a reaction to the Diocletian uh, ideal, right? Um, because he evidently had understood the need now for a balance that his own son, like the one of Constantius Clarus, for example, were were not embodying, and these new young forces that wanted and and could prevail. So, by stressing once again the Diocletian political line, he could try to reequilibrate the situation, maybe at his own advantage. For example, he participated to a congress in Carnuntum. Carnuntum is on the Danube, is close to to uh, Vienna, and uh, was a very important military base at the time as well, at the center in some ways of, you know, on the frontier here, you know that Pannonia was uh, one of the most militarized frontiers at this point, and it was very important, a bit of a crossroad between uh, Gaul, Italy, uh, Illyria, etc., so had this uh, quite a great importance, control of the Alps, Alpine passes um, from there, etc. So in this context, in Congress, interestingly, this happened in 308, um, even Diocletian participated. He was presided by Diocletian. So the old tetrarchs basically attempted to um, put 
again assert they intervened right so they, they into this mess they, they somewhat ad admitted indirectly that this the tetrarchy had failed and they decided to pose from their you know position of prestige a, cer a, a new order right a, a, a certain order at least into the chaos that had ensued but this was not possible now everything was gone out of control uh, on the contrary the congress at Carnuntum worsened the situation because uh, in the congress were appointed two um, uh, were appointed uh, as august galerius maximian and um, an officer that has distinguished himself during the persian campaign that was licinius right um and uh a word maybe about him can can be interesting licinius valerius licinianus licinius he was emperor um he, he lived um at this point um he had been born in uh the mid third century also in here he would die you know later he was um, uh, before um, it was some of the last to go in, in this sense uh, at the end of the all the mess the succession and the tetrarchy and he was a humble origins as well and he was appointed at Carnuntum as the um, and he had distinguished as we have seen uh, as uh, he he mainly rose because of the friendship with Galerius interestingly enough um, and uh, eventually he uh, he quarreled also with Maximinus Dyer for the control he f first allied himself with Constantine but we will see now how the thing developed and as Caesar at Carnuntum were um, appointed the two uh, surviving let's say uh, Caesars of 305 they were uh, Maximinus and Constantine though so as you understand from this new balance that is formed, um, this was a compromise mm, because uh, it accepted fundamentally the participation uh, to this, the, the new tetrarchy uh, of powers that had imposed themselves in spite of the tetrarchy, right? Um, and had emerged by himself. Constantine, especially, was. Um, was already sh showing these tendencies of of a, a visionary and you know pretty pretty concrete visionary however that that had his own view of how the empire had to be ruled etc and um he was already perceived at the time as a kind of a um as an exceptional figure right and 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 this is why the tetrarchy is really um at this point um, seriously a contradiction because uh, the mistake is even more evident because having recognized Constantine as Caesar you were simply recognizing in part the hereditary principle right Constantine when this was the son of Constantius uh, Constantius Chlorus so in another way he had succeeded to his father and this is what the tetrarchy originally had uh, theoretically tried to, to avoid at least in uh, uh, in uh, in in practice to 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 avoid this uh, concentration of power aside from the collegiality that was uh, that was wished uh, to be achieved and by appointing Licinius as Augustus there was a further competitor that was added to those who already existed and it was a competitor that since he could not in any way control Italy, Africa, and Spain, would have had to be content just with the Illyricum, right? So, after all, nor Constantine nor um, um, Maximinus um, were content with the title of Caesars. They considered themselves as Augusts, right? So, this is overly complicated, and um, at the same time, such a development one was kind of foreseeable. Like uh, it was even a too natural situation, given that uh, since the let's say uh, at Carnuntum, it was it had been appointed a man like Licinius that was had not been previously a Caesar, 
right? And therefore he could not consider himself, nor himself, an expression of the pure tetrarchic principle. So everything was basically a, a declaration of, of, of failure of the system that it was just an attempt basically to, to try to, to mediate a little bit this open uh, contrast that had been emerging, but at the end of the day was no factual um, solution to, to, to the problem. If anything, it kind of uh, accelerated and kind of formalized by by certain standards the, uh, the, the disgregation. In the meanwhile, uh, in 310, the old uh, Maximian uh, Herculius, uh, being this kind of perennial, eternal discontent and uh, dissatisfied, uh, constantly in search for that effective power that he had renounced during 305 that he was now you know, <laughs> regretting of uh, so much, came to, to conflict, to conflict with his own son-in-law, Constantine, right? Uh, Constantine, uh, now, I, I wouldn't like to stop too, too much on his personality, is definitely fascinating for what we can know about him, but let's say... For example, he uh, he already thought of himself to be the descendant of Claudius Gothicus rather than an adoptive um, member of the Her Herculi, for example. What does this mean? Claudius Gothicus was this uh, great figure in past history, Marcus Aurelius Claudius Augustus. He, he was of Illyrian in origin. Um, he was born uh, at the beginning of the 3rd century, and he immediately distinguished himself as a great officer of the time um, and um, the, he, he dealt with very serious situation of the crisis of the third century. He uh, protected the uh, Greece during invasions, during uh, the wars and he, um, he was entrusted also here with the control of the Illyricum by Valerianus. Um, so um, he was a great um, figure, he had become initially Dux Illyrici, so which means the, the, the ruler of Illyricum, and um, that he, um, let's say, um, he was one of also, one of, of, of those men on which Gallienus had hoped for, uh, had counted on in order to um, reform the Roman military, and the, and, and, and um, into which he, uh, Posed the hope into um, and, and trusted the hope of you know of, of saving and re uh, restoring the empire during the terrible crisis, and he was um, acclaimed eventually emperor in 268 um, by the su the same officers that instead had killed Gallienus, interestingly enough, and um, even the senate had backed him because there hadn't been much of a great um, think they could do at that point, especially given that the barbarians now were pressing pretty hard uh, at the gates. So that was the main problem. And and uh, um, Claudius uh, defeated a strong contingent of Germans at the Brenner, um, and he and um, uh, that had excuse me had poured from the Brenner Pass into the Garda Lake, and uh, and and uh, and even. Uh, the much stronger horde of Ostrogoths, Visigoths, Heralds, Jepids, etc., that was pushing from the Tnestr to the Danube rivers, um, was was now uh, threatening the eastern lands of the empire. So uh, w Claudius, at that point, left um, it, the the Alps, marched rapidly towards the Balkanic Peninsula. Uh, he pointed uh, at Thessalonica, and here he freed itself from the enemy, and then he um, attacked the greatest powers of the um, of, of of the Germans at in in uh, Mesia Superior, close to Nish, where he defeated them, uh, obtaining the, his uh, cognomen of Gothicus, right? And uh, and this was uh, one of the greatest generals and emperors of the time. Uh, he um, he 
effectively managed to to re uh, the you know to for example to settle down all the various prisoners he had made even to um to to make um to to ensure some sort of peace on the Danubian region and also to obtain some f successes against uh the the Persians and uh he um uh, dealt also with the secessions in Gaul and in the East that were not lesser problems that eventually were solved by uh, Aurelianus, as we will see. And um, he uh, had this uh, um, the sort of ability to play a little bit with the, the balance that this could give because these empires did this chunks of empire had separated, also had to deal with, with the barbarians in part. And um, and uh, he uh, died in 270 uh, in uh, by a plague, right? And uh, he therefore died with this uh, aura. Who he was consecrated after his death. You know, he was he was a key figure that even Italy Constantine wanted to uh, to claim some somewhat for, for uh, as a model. Um, as an imitation, after all, he was born, as we've seen, just ten years after the death of Claudius uh, Gothicus, and um, and and accepting this figure as um, the real, uh, as the fighter, basically. So he w was fundamentally had managed to 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 represent a sort of um, of great solver, right, of problems, a great. Not just a great commander, but also someone who could establish uh, an equilibrium as a single figure was a great, a great power, a great model to imitate. That um, was, in a certain sense, um, the idea of a monarch proper, like of a of a commander that was able not to share power but to still maintain it. Um, uh, and this was very important, in my opinion, ideologically speaking. Um, and and that's why the example of Claudius Gothicus um, was making Constantine acquire um, the the awareness of a sort of charismatic mission of on his own, right? That as we know would also seemingly evolve into what was apparently revealed to him as the vision of a solar symbol um, and the this you know ambiguous. Uh, symbol that was at the end of the day interpreted also as the, the, the Christian one but about which th there is no further you know, proof but also in here religious syncretism is important because a bit like Maxentius probably uh, he was really he had understood the importance of having a great um, uh, let's say a superior deity that could really embrace as it was normal like really at the time solar deity that was superior you know, basically, to all the others, like the idea of having um, a greater divinity, and then all the others that could fundamentally join, right? So, as we know, Constantine was not truly really, um, uh, an asserter of monotheism, right, as as we mean it, but he was the one that granted the Christians uh, freedom of cult, and uh, in this sense, didn't invent quite anything new, because also the Edict of Milan, as we will see, will was uh, was uh, formulated by Galerius, as we will see now, eventually retaken by Constantine with the Edict of Milan, but really the greatness of Constantine, that probably uh, this younger generation had understood better than the older one, paradoxically, or at least had been able to frame it in a more effective and and functional system. Never underestimate the generational capabilities to understand the present present times. Um uh, the Constantine in this was one of the greatest interpreters in history, but let's say it was to bring everything under a unique model. Like the tetrarchy already by name is the concept that, you know, you have four rulers at the end of the day. It doesn't matter the internal hierarchy of yeah, the Caesar, the the, the Augustus and the Caesar, etc. and the East and the West. Constantine pushed for something else, something that would become ultimately prevalent. Mm. And even if, yeah, the empire at the end of the, the the fourth century was split once again, and this was in a certain sense the, uh, even in there the the 
the overcome the the, sur the surpass of of Constantine of the Constantinian Empire, but um, only from let's say strictly administrative point of view, meaning that okay, the strategical situation required at that point that splitting, um, but um, a lot had happened in the meanwhile. Still, Constantinian formula, broadly speaking, institutionally speaking, religiously speaking, also militarily speaking, would remain, especially in the east, uh, at the base of what the Byzantine Empire, the, the Christian Roman Empire, effectively uh, was and became and remained also in there with great changes, but still having had this basis set very solidly, right? So, this is important as a perspective um, to understand. And Maximilian Herculius was um, effectively uh, eliminated or he killed himself, whatever, at Marseille. So at this point, um, um, uh, whether, whether it was Constantine to directly kill him or he got himself, you know, he got himself killed, doesn't matter. Uh, Constantine proved also in here to be the stronger opponent to have had a clearer vision, a more rational, more coherent plan, right? You know, not really a, a more coherent plan that was, could be ideologically driven or supported or backed, but that probably uh, hides a, uh, hit a, a very concrete and strong understanding of, of, of the whole empire having come at the time. Really, Constantine is, is dramatical, one of the greatest figures ever in true Roman history. Can't be, um, you know, those comments like, a uh, he ruined everything. Well, well the, let's leave them aside because it has nothing to do with factual history, fortunately enough. You know, you can't go to university and express certain ideas, uh, I mean, in front of a professor, because <laughs> you will not pass an exam of Roman history, and rightfully, by the way, because I also wouldn't let you pass. Um, and, and in some time, I hope I will be able to do it because, you know, one of my go-to pleasures would be also to to judge, to examine students, <laughs> you know. Um, but aside from this, a uh, little joke. Um, but this is very important, right? You can't come so prejudiced against uh, such figures without understanding their depth, their greatness, uh, because such judgments are just ideologically driven. I mean, they, they have no s consistency whatsoever. Um, so, as you understand, here we're skipping the strictly military side of the story because it's very complicated. But let's say that there was the... F the we're focusing especially on the tetrarchy. So, looking at the, the, the world thing in, in kind of a in the dissolution of the tetrarchy, perspectively, the, the world situation basically degenerated uh, and fell uh, definitely in 311. At this time, Galerius um, got ill, very ill. And at this point, he uh, Galerius had basically applied, he had persecuted the Christians, right? Or at least there had still had been they, they had been following the the uh, traditional persecution that has started in Diocletian's time so Galerius initially thought that his um, illness um, was attributable to the persecution against the Christians and therefore he emanated this edict of tolerance in April 311 in order to uh, you know please the Christian God Right, but he died, so evidently it didn't quite work, did it? Um, but it's important because this edict, as we were saying before, will remain at the base of, uh, of Constantine's um, uh, edict. It was basically reformulated, kind of only few, you know, with a few modifications in Milan, where uh, a year later or two years later, I remember, um, in order to 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 grant the freedom of cult to to the Christians. Um, so at this point, since Galerius had died in this, immediately uh, Maximinus uh, took possession of Galerius' territory, because theoretically the the, the tetrarchy worked in a way that the 
the empire was effectively split into four territorial entities like uh, there wasn't just east and west there was a further section like one f one fort controlled by the augustus another fort controlled by caesar and then the other two forts uh, in the same way uh, in the other half so at this point uh, other failure of the tetrarchy Maximinus seizes Galerius' territory and therefore unifies all the east from Syria to Asia Minor, right? So, um, at this point, uh, what did remain? Well, Licinius, who was Augustus of the Lyricum, and Maxentius, that was considered the at this point the usurper theoretically because he had stayed out of the of Carnuntum and all that stuff, so of Italy and Africa, right? And then there was Constantine, of course, there was Augustus of Gaul, Spain, and Britain, right? So, uh, in some ways, after all, the, the principles of Carnuntum could be considered as safe um, um, if um, two Augusts, that is, the real and true August, the colleague of Maximian, Galerius at Carnuntum, that was Licinius, and the two Caesars of Carnuntum, that is um, Maximinus and, and Constantine. Um, so the real intruder, and that's why he was considered the usur usurper theoretically, uh, in this system, in the name of three Augusts, that is pretty weird for a tetrarchy that had conceived only two, was however Maxentius. Um, so um, the mm, considering uh, the, the the three Augusts in terms in order of um, of age and power, there would be f fundamentally uh, Maximinus, Constantine, and Licinius. Right. This 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 is important because you realize that even among the the Augusts, there was still the the el the senior one, like the old the elder one, and therefore the one that theoretically was formally was more powerful. And then there was real power that naturally was all another thing. So at this point things got uh, rough for Maxentius because uh, all the three Augusts um, allied themselves against him. Uh, albeit, he, uh, the only one who actually was uh, entrusted with the task of the war was Constantine, right? Uh, principally because he was in the West. So um, uh, in this, the war started in 312. As we know, there are these battles that maybe one um, one uh, one day we will look better at um, in dedicated uh, battle videos. Um, and there is this first battle at Turin, the second at Verona, and 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 basically the the, the way to Rome was open at this point, and we know how it went. So. At this point, I would like to conclude, um, in fact, without going further, because this is really about the tetrarchy. I don't, I don't plan to make it a story of all the details now, and also how the thing evolved later, we w w that we will discuss on another occasion. But I would like to come back a little bit at the beginning at, with the conclusion, because Diocletian at this time was still alive, <laughs> interestingly enough. Uh, even he was um, confined as a mayor observer, right, from his beautiful residence uh, in uh, in Croatia. <laughs> um, he, uh, in Dalmatia, Dalmatia, or Dalmatia, if you prefer, um, he, um, you know, he was definitely assessing a, a failure, right, because from some side, he, from, from a certain side, you know, um, there was this major element, the fall of the tetrarchy, right? Uh, the tetrarchic system, and the anti-Christian fight. So these two things had evidently been, uh, you know, had vanished because Galerius uh, granted the Christians freedom of cult. Constantine would have done it anyway. The tetrarchy had died. Um, so his policy had failed, or at least was destined to fail at this point. Um, there was also a, a broader concept, though, that especially will be uh, stressed in Constantine times, that 
we could debate about it really. I think historiographically there is some debate. It's it's a economic policy, right? The the idea of backing the denarius, that is, the the currency of the small landowners and the, of even of the, the the masses of the plebs, um, that had been a bit. Um, you know, Diocletian had kept devaluating it, but still maintaining it, right? Tried to, um, essentially never to, to, to surrender to the senatorial luxus, like, of, of the solidus that eventually from Constantine onwards will become the base of the imperial econ currency, at least. And, um, so, uh, we will see it another time, but it, it was an old world that was dying, right? Um, and Diocletian had been the last defender of this world. Uh, it was a world that had been demolished in his own, uh, in his own, mm, let's say, reasons. Because th th this is not really, it, it was not really a matter of a choice, but um, it was a prerequisite. Right, that had gone away forever at this point. That uh, that couldn't be that couldn't make the old structure, the principate, being held together. This is already a dominatus properly, and and Diocletian had hoped that in some ways the the balance could still hold. Why he did it, it's difficult to say. It's difficult to understand really the the also the the conviction, the beliefs like. Um, the ways um, these characters looked at their own worlds. Like, Diocletian and Constantine, in this sense, were definitely very different, but we don't truly really know uh, how much of their actions were dictated by true belief um, in, in such, and in, in, in true awareness, right? Because these changes had taken centuries to, to, to develop and would still you know, even with Constantine, it's not that one system is set and it, it's immediately applied, right? There are certain coming backs, afterthoughts, um, and, but the same, uh, on the long run, we know that eventually things took that direction. So it would be very interesting to really know what the, uh, what the idea was, right? These are big questions. Let's, well, what is the Constantine thought about the Christians, really, or or about paganism, or what what about, about Diocletian? I mean, what was the, you know, the general interpretation that is given is, okay, Diocletian really wanted to to insist on the on the on tradition because it was tradition that had ensured Rome to um, to to be what it had been. Right, so the idea is that if Augustus had founded the empire in this fashion, that was the the right way because every other emperor, like the, the Augusts uh, here, we have, we have seen him in the Thirty, would have would have had to follow him. But at the same time, we know the same Diocletian pushed towards other directions, and the same Constantine. And at this point, it, it's the great question of the story. You know, which god to to take? Like this is not really about the actual belief or culture practice it's really about making a broader cultural choice right is is betting on something that insists on the tradition but refuses to acknowledge change or is it better to bet on on the new that is risky but it, it, it's bold but it's it's also what seems to be working better now seems to really respond to the needs of that particular society. Now, here I'm just giving food for thought. I'm not really telling you, you know, the, first of all, we can't answer these questions. We can't properly assess, as we were saying before, the beliefs, the intentions, the the the, the rationalization of such ideas. It probably was a much deeper change that... Uh, in the impersonality of the empire, especially how it was going to grow, and the the, the greatness of the the, the statal system and of the greater Rome, we have difficulties to understand. But these were individuals that that were posed these questions in a way or another, and they had to answer to them. So Constantine won, 
and Constantine had uh, pretty heavy responsibilities uh, that are reflected by his own, eventually his own life, his own policy. I mean, it, it wasn't easy, right? It wasn't easy even to, it wasn't a winning card that could be immediately played to say, oh, see, I, I made it, right? Uh, it was a, a moment of a fort. We can't even really know um, within this the the entourage of, of these men who really put that at fruit. You know what about these reforms? I mean, w was really was it really Diocletian or Constantine that pushed for the um, eventually for the uh, difference uh, in currency in the uh, different. Um, you know, in, in in the different economical direction that the empire had to take, together with its policy and and society that were directly affected by these reforms, uh, or was it part of a broader system? It was a kind of a deep state thing, you know, that pushed for for, for these changes to happen because evidently the structures weren't holding anymore. And it's quite likely, by the way, it was both, right? Um, so this is a phase that we'll definitely have to um, to go way, way more in detail in, in the future. And for now, this was um, uh, like it. And I would say that uh, in any case, uh, the tetrarchy was... If the tetrarchy was a defense of the traditional system, this defense was desperate. And uh, and it failed, right? And 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 these are big outcomes. Like you you can't not you cannot but take it into consideration, right? It's it, it can't be seen otherwise. Um, if you look at the statues of the tetrarchs, like you can see in in, in, the, in the sculptures in Parfit at uh, Saint Mark in Venice can see this man that were you know really very spirited and tormented you know because of looking at each other and whispering and um, being cautious someone was not listening to him because it was a big conspiracy right it was a big um, uh, if you want um, um, vanity that uh, you know the old could still survive with a sort of um, uh, ideal and somehow uh, intellectual, by a certain degree, order and action and direction rather than a real observation of reality. This is important because there are two different levels between reality and, uh, let's say, and the ideology and the ideal. Uh, uh, because you can see paradoxically that the the greater ideological side, there was Constantinian one that was naturally pushing for uh, a monarchic direction and, and consequently, a um, uh, you know a, an expansion even of the propagandistic means of this great idea that it was a, a unique center, a unique greatness, um, was paradoxically grounded in much more pragmatic uh, reasons and motives than what the Tetrarchy was. The Tetrarchy was trying to stress the uh, it was ideological in itself right but it was trying to stress uh, a continuity that was quite disconnected with reality or at least a view of the world that was highly dysfunctional um, and that um, it, it would be also very interesting to to start in its own origins because these are not after all such enormously distant times from you know from when the, the empire was still functioning in, in kind of a decent fashion it was the, the previous two or three generations that had witnessed the real big crisis of the third century so it would be very interesting to understand the background of these figures and to to observe what um what motives were really pushing this 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 decision right it was a a delirium of of power thinking that the system could go simply at the way you 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 wished 
um, because that's quite bold to assume that even for a mortal, right, that if this was divinely oriented, I think um, it was much more, um, you know, uh, say, daring than thinking that, okay, uh, I, I'll simply embrace a, a symbol and, and work with it, then stressing some f something that, for example, was not really... Uh, uh, had never been tested because the tetrarchy was looking at the past but it was in many ways something something new so how could really Diocletian even think that this could work on which premises like on which just justifications right the fact that they had put back the empire together well in part you know had mostly due to our Aurelianus to be uh, to be honest but um, Definitely, it was a pride of the energy, of a strength. This man had been like Diocletian um, and Maximian Herculius, that that had been masters of the situation. But they had been uh, maybe well, maybe I'm going too far now, thinking that this might have been a reaction for towards the 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 idea of settling things once for all. But it was a limit. It was a limit, and it was Constantine, paradoxically, that did it by changing everything. And it takes a lot of intelligence to do that. Uh, it takes a lot of intelligence to do that, or at least to, to second this change, to, to understand the, the deeper mechanisms of this all. And in any case, there are many other uh, considerations that can be done, especially also how this clientele and the, f the loyalty to the troops, the, de the decline of the senatorial um, direction. Um, today we didn't do, didn't look thoroughly into the figure of Maxentius that is also particularly um, interesting and fascinating because that proposed another model. It was traditionalist, but maybe it had some, you know, some some spark of this opening to to innovation after all. Right, not not a radical change. Constan Constantine himself had been called uh, historiographically sometimes a kind of a revolutionary. I, I don't like this term, frankly, because I don't think it's correct. Um, and um, but he definitely went beyond. Like he he definitely understood something that the others, for reasons that were naturally devoid to of. Um, you know of the context also the context from which Constantine was was born was particularly important the, even the coming back under Julianus this hatred that also existed towards Constantine lineage that was the legitimate one etc um, must have had an influence in this process and probably uh, was decisive anyhow uh, we will talk about this other times. For now, I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it, otherwise leave a like, or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming contents. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time, and see you next time.